Let's pray. Oh, we take a deep breath, God. Lord, as we enter this new year, may we hear your word. May we take it in and slow down just a bit. Understand what it means to keep awake. I reflected on today's gospel lesson. I started thinking, I read an article that talked about Eugene Peterson. Have you heard that name before? Um, he's a very popular theologian. Uh, he's one of those guys, um, almost like Philip Yancey, who's written book after book that people love to read. He's a theologian and a preacher, and um, he passed away a few years ago. At his funeral, his son, did the eulogy. And when he talked about his dad, he said, my dad had one sermon. That for 29 years of writing books and preaching sermons, he had everyone fooled because there was just one sermon. He said that message that he had was a secret that he shared with me, he said. Early on in life, that as Leaf would sleep in his bed, his father would tiptoe into his room and whisper it into his ear. And he said, that gospel message is this. God loves you. God is on your side. God is coming after you. And God is relentless. God loves you. God is on your side. God is coming after you. God is relentless. Well, the gospel lesson that we have for today makes it pretty hard to hear that message. It seems to go against everything that we know about the good news of Jesus Christ, who promises us that all of our sins are forgiven, that we are to love our neighbors and that the and, and that the last will be first. At a text study one time, we, uh, my fellow Lutheran pastors from the area and I were talking about this scripture verse and the parables that come after it. And for the next few weeks, you'll be hearing those parables as you, as you come to church. And one of my colleagues that were talking about this scripture for a while finally just said, wouldn't it be great if we were Southern Baptist preachers during this time? We could preach a fire and brimstone, and we wouldn't even have to worry about it. Of course, that was a joke, um, and uh, there was a Southern Baptist preacher there who laughed when we talked to him about it. Our faith and our salvation through grace alone is a far cry from fire and brimstone. And if you hear me say nothing else today, hear this. God has given you salvation. All of your sins are forgiven. Eternal life is yours because and only because God loves you. Period. It's that simple. But still, we have to reach to figure out what on earth Jesus can be saying in these words that he speaks today. Where we must keep alert or else. This isn't the only time that he says it either. It sounds like those who do not keep awake will miss their chance and the doors of heaven will be closed for sleeping. We can pick this apart all day long and we can try and try to manipulate it to mean whatever we want it to mean, but here's the deal. When we pick apart all of those details, we lose the whole point of what Jesus is saying. As a colleague of mine said one time, the point of the book, The Little Engine That Could, isn't that trains can talk, right? <laughs> There's a different message here. The bottom line is not in the details. The bottom line is that Jesus is about to be killed. These words are shocking because they need to be. There's a distinct urgency for the people to hear what he has to say. You've been there before, right? When you say something over and over again and the people that you're speaking to just don't get it. If you're a parent, maybe it's happened with a child. If you're a child, maybe it's happened with a parent or maybe it's happened with a boss or a sibling. You need someone to hear it, but they just don't get it. 
You say it calmly. You yell it. You use an example. You get dramatic. And then eventually you just have to let them figure it out on their own. But here, in today's scripture, Jesus is at the dramatic stage. You guys have got to hear what I'm saying. Listen to what I'm telling you. You think it's not going to happen, but it is. You will be judged by God. You think that you don't have to be ready, but you do. Keep awake. And within a few days, it all starts to happen. The Last Supper, Judas' betrayal, and the march to the cross. And we kind of have a pretty good view here 2,000 years later, right? We think about all of the different contexts. We've got Jesus talking to people who are living a pretty, in a pretty sound world where they've got this beautiful temple. Um, and then we have Matthew writing about this in about 90 AD, 60 years later, when the temple has actually been destroyed. A generation has passed since Jesus said these words, but the second coming hasn't happened yet. And here we are. We know what happened. We know that Jesus actually did die, that he did come back, and that he has ascended to heaven. So what do we do with these words now as we live in this place? After Jesus has died, but before the second coming. First of all, hear this as a call to discipleship. When Jesus calls us to be his disciples, this is not a complacent job. We don't just show up. Keep awake, Jesus says. For some of us, of course, sometimes all we can do is keep awake, right? And if we can't do any more, then that's okay. But for most of us, we can feed the hungry. For most of us, we can shelter the homeless. We can educate the oppressed. We can be there for people who are in need. We are called to come to God with all of who we are. Give yourself to God, all that you have, knowing that that may mean that you have to lose sometimes. It may mean that you have to do some things that are hard, but still give all of yourself to God. <clears throat> and the second thing we hear from this is don't get so caught up in arguing about the when and the where and the how, like the people are doing today in the gospel lesson. Don't get so caught up in all of that that you miss seeing God right before your eyes. How many of us wish that we could replace conversations about buildings and budgets with conversations about how are you doing, my friend? How many of us talk so much about how do we pray that we don't find enough time to pray? The people in today's gospel lesson literally have God in the flesh and blood standing right before them. But they're getting so caught up in talking about traditions and rules and is he doing this right and how can we believe that this is real that they're not seeing God right there. Do we do the same thing? And in this season of Advent, as we prepare for Christmas and my goodness, I've already gotten caught up in it. Texts to my sister-in-law and my brother and my mom. Where are the boys' lists? <laughs> what do you want for Christmas? Do we get so caught up in that that we forget what it's all about? A couple of years ago, I attended a funeral for a friend, and at, in the benediction, the pastor reminded us of something that Dr. Martin Luther King said. He said, darkness cannot drive out darkness only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. As we are here in the midst of Advent, and we ponder who we are as disciples of Christ, and we wonder what does it mean to keep awake? What does it mean to prepare for the coming of Christ? We are to remember that love drives out 
that light drives out darkness. And we, as disciples of Christ, are the ones who bring that light, who bring that love into this world. Think about what happens again just a couple weeks after this lesson. Jesus is in the garden after the Last Supper with the disciples, and he says to them, please just keep awake. He begins to pray. And what do the disciples do? They fall asleep. And because they do, they miss those moments with Christ. Let's not miss any of those. Keep awake. 